Welcome to the Me and My Health Up podcast show, Jamie. How are you today? I'm really good. Thanks for inviting me on the show, Anthony. Coming across the podcast itself was very enlightening for the mental health topics you discuss, and I'm really excited to dive into more mental health conversations today. Uh, yes, so great to uh, have you on, and and yeah, fascinating in terms of how you've connected with me. It's actually through the podcast, so uh, uh, it's actually the first, probably the guest that's come through the podcast. I think um, so. Uh, yeah, I always love first, and uh, so really welcome you, Jamie, and uh, you take a very unique approach uh, to mental health. Uh, we're, we're titling the episode "The Stoic Approach to Mental Health." So please. Tell us a bit more, uh, I guess, before we get into that, it'd be really good for the listeners to really understand your backstory, how you've arrived at what you're doing today. Yeah, well, this is going to get into a really nerdy conversation because I love all these deep dives. (laughs) So basically, my background actually comes from copywriting. That's what I do for a living. But the mental health side started when I was very young as a, a kid and You know, from my generation, really, I'm in my late 20s and the dichotomy of different generations learning different things is always fascinating to me. But equally, there was also a lot of stress on mental health as well when, you know, you're young as a kid too. And I'll hold my hands up and be 100% transparent as a, a young lad. I had a bad history of social anxiety. And I think as men particularly, obviously, we're kind of or sometimes we look to think that we can't talk about our feelings openly sometimes and I really struggled with that when I was younger even into my early 20s that was quite difficult to sort of broach and to do in a work environment and even over the pandemic that was even worse because obviously we're all going through a lot of anxiety so we were all in the same boat and my personal anxiety was kind of going haywire and I really needed something to recalibrate myself and it happened to be philosophy. Now that hit me out of nowhere because I didn't study philosophy. I didn't really know that much about it beyond the subject as being something hmm, quite ac- academic and quite dry. You know, I had sort of preconceptions about it, but something that I also had as well in the pandemic was nothing but time. So podcasts were great. Started listening to a bunch of philosophy led podcasts and what really resonated with me was a stoic podcast called the daily stoic by a guy called ryan holiday and the way he broke down that philosophy the way the practices and the accessibility of it really resonated with me and just anything that remotely interests me i have a a habit of just diving down the rabbit hole as much as possible and from there it just like grew and grew and i I love the simplicity of the philosophy and how it can improve mental health, but also make you more conscious of your environment as well. Yeah, so please please share this stoic approach to mental health. Inform the listeners as to what it is, where it comes from, and how it works. Indeed, and what I should say first is there's a big difference between little S stoicism and big S stoicism, which is the philosophy of stoicism. And that was something that I had to kind of get my head around too, because the little S stoicism thing to me was that, that character trait of, as the British like to say, Oh, keep a tough upper lip or stiff upper lip. Don't really talk about what's going on. Just grit your teeth and bear it. And I think a lot of us can be sort of preconditioned to believe that. Whereas the, philosophy of stoicism is the opposite it's teaching you how to regulate your emotions it's understanding how to act appropriately in the world and with the people around you and the philosophy itself goes back to ancient greece with a guy called zeno Ascitium. now take this uh, story with a pinch of salt because a lot of antiquity based stories you know it's like whispers that get sort of Um, exaggerated and added and added. So this is my version of the story. We'll see how it goes. So Zeno was a merchant who was um, moving precious goods to Athens, I believe. And he was caught in a shipwreck, which completely turned his whole world upside down. He was left stranded without anything. He needed to recalibrate himself. He was in the Athenian marketplace trying to hold on to something and he wandered into a bookstore now he was fascinated by the books that he found he found a book 
by the philosopher Xenophon, who wrote about Socrates. And this blew his mind. And he looked to the bookseller and said, where can I find guys like this who can teach me these kind of things? And as the story goes, another philosopher was walking past called Crates. And the bookseller pointed him out and said, that's the guy you're looking for. And from that point on, Zeno followed Crates, who was a cynic philosopher. Cynicism is where Stoicism kind of got its roots through learning from Crates, Zeno developed his own perspective on the world and he took those teachings and went to a place called the Stoa in the Athenian marketplace, which is also called the Painted Porch. People could debate their ideas openly, which is where the Stoicism version of the Stoa came from. Zeno based his principles on four key pillars. It was justice, wisdom, temperance and courage. And really that is the root of Stoicism. At its most basic level, it is controlling what you can control. And to me, that was the easiest way in. But there's far more far more depth to it once you start learning about the practices and trying to apply them to your life in specific ways. And uh, so what practices really helped you that you learned? Oh, I love this question because there's it always changes. <laughs> Um, in terms of particular Stoic practices, there's three or four that really stand out to me. One of them is called the view from above, which is attributed to the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. And as an aside, this is quite fascinating when I found out this. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has a lot of its original roots in Stoicism. The originators of that psychology actually were inspired by the ancient stoics and this view from above has a cbt connotation to it so marcus aurelius wrote in his diaries the meditations about his own personal development he was trying to publish things for himself just to be a better person at the end of the day and remind himself to be a good person the view from above essentially boils down to taking a step back from yourself and to take more of a big picture view of a situation so you can diffuse emotions such as anger or anxiety. So a practical example of that for me, if I was feeling socially anxious for whatever reason, I might think to myself, I'll imagine myself stepping out of myself first, looking down at me personally, then I'll take it a step further and imagine I'm looking down at the city. I can see lots of people around me who are going through the exact same things day to day, you know, they might not like the job, they might have their own problems that they're dealing with, and it sort of puts you on their same level. Then you can go one step higher and watch the whole earth, hence the view from above, and then you slowly, slowly come back down into yourself. And by that point, you can see that what you were thinking in that moment is probably not as bad as you thought it was against the grand scheme of things. Another one is called the premeditation of adversity, which is usually attributed to another stoic philosopher called Seneca and nobody will be able to see this on the podcast but I have a visual aid here it's um Seneca's book called Letters from a Stoic I would highly recommend anybody reads this if they want kind of a beginner's view into the philosophy Seneca himself was quite a fascinating person he was a man of many contradictions he was a power broker and advisor to the Emperor Nero but he was also very much in love with his practical philosophy and stoicism and he tried to do the best he could in the situation that he had. His world was very chaotic and within one of the letters that he, he says to his friend Lucilius, the quote that, let me just bring up here because I'm a bit of a quoteaholic and I like to reel these off purely for my own uh, remembrance. The quote from the premeditation of adversity from Seneca is, we should project our thoughts ahead of us at every turn and have in mind every possible eventuality instead of only the usual course of events. This is why we need to envisage every possibility and to strengthen the spirit, to deal with things which may conceivably come about. Rehearse them in your mind, exile, torture, war and shipwreck. And now when I came across this concept as well, I, I scratched my head a bit because that sounded quite negative to me, but it's the opposite. It's rehearsing for the worst case scenario so you can be, be better prepared to be more resilient against it. A practical example of that in copywriting, what I do, I might say to myself that I can prepare as much as I want to go with a, a client who I'm going to do the research for. What would the worst case scenario be? Oh, I might not be prepared. 
but I can rehearse it again and again in my head. So I might do some extra research. I might do some competitor research. I might look at how they present themselves on social media. I could arm myself with that knowledge and that call could go great, but the outcome is uncertain. The point is I was better able to build up some resilience and prepare for that ahead of time by practicing that premeditation of adversity. And the third one is called Amor Fati, which is attributed to Frederick Nietzsche, who wasn't a Stoic himself, I don't think, but the Stoics themselves believed in a similar concept, which is a love of one's fate. And to me, that is about, um, what? how should I put this? It's about looking at the whole lot of your life and imagining that all the good and the bad, it's nothing how you thought it would turn out, but equally it is how it would turn out. You don't want anything to change about it. And initially when looking at that, I thought, I don't want to surrender. I don't want to be passive. I thought that was quite a passive concept, but when you flip it on its head, that's why I think Amor Fati is. It's trying to have a toolbox of resilience again. A practical example of that for me is a conversation with a friend might not go to plan, but I'll think to myself, oh, Amor Fati, love my fate. If I'm stuck in traffic, oh, Amor Fati, you know, I can't control it. So just appreciate that small moment in that one microcosm. And those practices personally for me have been absolutely game changing and from a practical point of view, anybody can access them. Philo the, the philosophy of Stoicism is wide open for people of all backgrounds, faiths and creeds. Yeah, it's fantastic. I really liked uh, the three that you shared with us, uh, particularly taking that bird's eye view of the, you know, your thought. And I think what generally happens is that people um, stew on the thought and the, the thought becomes a lot exaggerated and, you know, scarier the more they just focus on the thought. But you capture the thought, you recognize the thought, you then step away from yourself and you look at it from like a, a bird's eye view and eventually you step your way out of the universe and, and, and you're putting that thought in perspective, uh, which is fantastic. So essentially that thought is being uh, put into context and dissolved in some sort of way. It's been minusculed as opposed to exaggerated and made bigger, which generally what happens when people are stewing on issues, uh, they make them bigger and worse and scarier. So I, I, I really like that. And then, you know, the, the, the second point around that preparing for the worst um, uh, case scenario and, uh, Again, I mean, corporations do this in terms of their plan B, plan C, and, you know, obviously a lot of that sort of uh, scenarios were played out during COVID. And, yeah, so it's certainly, it's that good, um, uh, I guess, as you said, in copyright, it just makes you prepare better. Um, and so you obviously do a better job for, the, uh, for your client uh, because you're preparing uh, and, yeah, I, I guess, you know, and, and looking at different ways in which uh, you can better write and um, better convey your message. And then that third one, you know, I thought was really good because essentially a lot of, you know, mental health concerns can arise from we're focusing on the things that we can't control as opposed to the ones that are in our inner circle of influence. Uh, so I really like that. And it's something that I constantly share with my clients, like, you know, like the COVID pandemic was out of our control, right? You know, we, we, we could only deal within our, you know, immediate actions around how we, um, you know, how we approached it or, you know, how we wanted to um, take actions to improve our health or, and there was like lots of stories I heard coming out of COVID, like people, you know, actually went deeper into their health and become healthier as a result of it, which, you know, is a great outcome because they were focusing on what they could control was their own health. I mean, they can't control the, the, the virus as such. So, um, I, I, yeah, that, those three that you brought up are fantastic. Are there any others that you've come across um, that you thought, you know, really, really uh, useful for the, the listeners? Yeah, the last one that really comes to mind is the concept of memento mori, and that essentially it translates from Latin as remember you will die. Again, quite morbid when you first think about it, but it's the opposite of it. To me, it's 
looking at life as in you've only got it's temporal, it's ephemeral. You've only got a short amount of time on the planet to accelerate your time to be a good person. Focus again on the things that bring you joy, that bring you passion. And a practical example of that for me with my own mental health again. In my family, we have a congenital disease of muscular dystrophy on my father's side. And that again, that was out of our control. We've known about that for about 10 years. And there was always that sort of little voice in the back of my head. What if I have it? What if I pass it on to my future kids? And up until getting tested, I actually wore a Memento Mori medallion for about 30 days after I got the test. And I just kept thinking to myself, trying to pair it with that premeditation of adversity exercise as well. Just what if, what if, what, what if I do have it? What if I don't? And by doing that repeatedly, it really kind of, just you know muted the anxiety about it and luckily i didn't have it and that was just such a i can't tell you how much of a relief that was for the family for my mental health for everything it was just such a weight off my shoulders and those two exercises while preparing for that you know i, I don't know what would have happened if i did have it but at least those exercises would have better prepared me for it and that is just remembering what you have in front of you, you have the power to decide on your internal resources and to make the most of them while they are there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, I think, um, yeah, that would have been a really hard period uh, for you, you know, in terms of the unknown, but, uh, as you said, you were thinking about all sorts of scenarios and, and how potentially that would play out. And I guess that, in, in that sense, it puts you into some control because you're um, thinking as to what actions you could take and what you can do about it. It's like what you can do about it, um, it, it, you know, as opposed to worrying about something that you can't do anything about. Like it's sort of, and it, I guess in, in, in a sense, it helps with that acceptance, doesn't it? Um, that if it does play out in one of your scenarios, well, you, you, you've already rehearsed it, so to speak. So... Um, as much as you don't want it, uh, you've, you can probably better accept it uh, and it won't come as such a shock. But it's easier said than done and I'm not saying that it's easy or it's like it's not like a magic bullet. Stoicism is not a magic bullet that will cure anxiety. I don't say that. It's a way to better manage and cope with p potential scenarios where you might experience certain mental, certain mental health conditions. But equally, I find that lovely as well in the fact that another mission that I like to say is I'm on a mission to make philosophy sexy and down to earth because in the pandemic, I thought, wow, this is really sexy to me because it's it's just transformed my perception of the world in so many profound ways. I, I really just love sharing it with people and to try to make it accessible to what they believe in because I think at the end of the day, we all have a personal philosophy or a set of values that we believe in. It's taking what you think in your internal world and living it in the outer world. And that's why I like to look at the distinctions between, you know, that academic style of studying philosophy versus philosophy is something that you practice in life. And I really think stoicism has that practical application to do that. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic that you're um, living what you're preaching. Uh, so that's fantastic you know, really authentic way to uh, go and, and, and it, you know, works for you. So you're sharing what works for you and and others can give that a try. It may or may not work for them, but uh, at least it's another um, you know, resource that they can call upon. Uh, and, you know, everyone's completely unique and different, as you're aware. And, you know, you've probably tried some mental health practices that other people have shared and you just think, well, you know, it just doesn't work for me. And like, you know, I, I hear that a lot in clinic uh, as well around meditation. You know, it just can't, you know, just it's just not me. <laughs> you know, like it's, uh, but, you know, there'll be something else, some other form of mindfulness that really resonates with them. Uh, so is, what other mental health practices have you come across that have really helped you along your journey? Oh, that's a good question, because there are a lot. So going a bit further away from Western philosophy, I'm a bit of a Japanophile. I love Japanese culture. Diving into that sort of 
viewpoint with like Buddhism and Japanese philosophy. That's very interesting. There are a couple of techniques that sort of have really helped me. One of them is called forest bathing. And when I first heard that, I was thinking, surely I'm not going to run through the forest naked. No, 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 no. Thank God it was not that. Yeah, literally it's just walking in like a green space and trying to take a moment to breathe, listen to the bird song, try to be more present in that natural environment and clear your mind. And I love doing that in the summer months. It's very empowering and very freeing. I also really like the idea of kintsugi, which is fixing broken pottery in the Japanese lens. And the cracks are gold, and it's kind of looking at imperfection as something that is beautiful. You know, flaws are meant to be beautiful. I think our scars can make us so much stronger. And once you embrace that, I think that is how you become your authentic self. I really love that uh, forest bathing. I, I have heard of that um, term, and when I actually first heard of it, I had the same sort of picture as what you did. <laughs> but thanks for uh, sharing what it actually is to the listeners, <laughs> so that they can. Uh, it's something that uh, you know. It's going for that walk in nature, isn't it? And um, yeah, just being present with nature and connecting with the sounds you're hearing, what you're seeing, and. Uh, taking taking in the yeah the uh, I guess through uh, taking in everything through your senses um, yeah so uh, yeah I, I think I certainly had that same impression of forest bathing um, um, and uh, yeah, what else would you like to share with the listeners around mental health? Well, I'd like to say that obviously everybody is going through their own unique situations, and as we discussed as well. I don't claim to offer any advice that cannot work for that particular person. I can only share my personal experience. But what I have found is there's multiple kinds of philosophy that can be applied to mental health. There's Stoicism, there's Epicureanism, which is slightly different, but also has very similar principles. There's existentialism, which preaches trying to be free. That's another interesting rabbit hole to dive into. But what I do like as the universal connector of the subject is each kind of school of thought is trying to bring the path towards a happy life or your best lived life. It's trying to improve yourself as a person, trying to uplift everyone around you. And I think we can all resonate with that at the end of the day, regardless of what you believe. It's just about being a better human being and improving your mental health and improving other people's mental health with very small acts of kindness is the right way to start, I think. Absolutely. And, and you're living that, Jamie, you know, in terms of your own mental health journey, uh, digging deep into the research and looking at uh, what are, you know, what are the avenues that you can continue to improve your mental health. And uh, it's, it's a constant and never ending journey around improving yourself. And, and then, and I really love your, what, what you do is you, take what works for you and you advocate that and, and, and share that with others. And then, you know, that gives them the opportunity to know about another useful tool that may be helpful for them. Uh, it may not be, as you say, because, you know, everyone's unique and different and what works for one person may not work for the other. But I really love that approach. And I also love that last point you made, which was around the flaws and, and, and not seeing them as, um, uh, you know imperfections but it's it's part of the uh it's part of the journey of growing and um and accepting who you are and you know your unique characteristics as opposed to exaggerating those flaws and seeing them as something that's uh that's imperfect um so uh because i i think what i see today is a lot of um you know this uh, i guess body image and uh body uh, dysmorphia and things like that and you know people as you mentioned in the very start of the podcast just focusing on small things and really exaggerating them and make them, making them out to be really big problems but in the scheme of things they're they're nothing and if you look at it from another perspective some people may admire at that what they think is a flaw in them some people may say that that's something I want, you know, like, um, <laughs> so, uh, 
yeah, I, I thought that was a, another good thing that you uh, shared was around that, um, uh, you know, crafting yourself to be a better version of you. And I suppose I'd like to also touch on one of your previous episodes with Dr. John DiMartini, actually, because I was thinking about how, you know, the brain gets rewired with trying to cultivate better habits. And I do believe that is very important from a mental health perspective as well. Again, everybody has their own way of doing this. But once you kind of have that routine that you can build upon, you have that strong bedrock, then the more you repeat that, you know, you live it then. And then that is another kind of philosophy. So I find that a very powerful concept. Absolutely. And uh, having read, you know, many of uh, Dr. John Martini's books, it's all about finding that, uh, you know, in, in order to change something in the brain, you've got to develop many neural pathways and really embed that connection. Uh, and he talks about, you know, I guess, strengthening those myelin sheets around the neural uh, networks. And uh, so, you know, often when he's working with his clients, he'll actually keep asking them, uh, what else, what else? And they keep coming up with more examples and strong strengthening that connection in terms of dissolving that negative thought uh, or helping them through it, you know, a challenge. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it, it's exactly that. In order to rewire, we, it's that repetition is the key. And I'm sure that all the practices that you've shared are, are, are constantly applied throughout your day when, because thoughts are constantly coming in, in, into our head and uh, positive and negative, um, uh, depending on environmental triggers and, and uh, random thoughts just pop in there. And uh, yeah, it, it's really up to us whether we want to just let that th thought pass through or we want to examine that thought further. And as you've done, you know, you shared in terms of put that thought into perspective. Um, and um, Oh, there, there was one more uh, technique that's actually just come into my brain now, and it's just going back to the simplicity of stoicism in itself. It's You think it is simple, but the work comes from trying to actually do it and apply it every day. And I'll admit, just, there are days where I don't feel like being very stoic because things get in the way and you do have to reframe it again. I, I get knocked back. We all get knocked back. But it goes back to the idea of you know earning your scars and trying to embrace them. And a very simple way of doing that is just to journal. The Stoics love journaling. Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, they both love just jotting down points. And even if it's just three good things that started in the day, that was game changing for me at the latter stage of the pandemic because it just, again, it, it's rewiring the brain to just think about this at the beginning and the end of the day. Absolutely. And the, the power in writing it down and seeing it, uh, you know, it, it sort of brings it out and, and it does, it helps with those connections of, uh, you know, and, and you, you, uh, that you embed that thought of gratitude um, and that gratitude compounds, that gratitude thinking just compounds the more you do it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And it's one of the uh, big uh, things that Dr. Martini also talks about is, you know, love and gratitude is what everything is all about. But uh, he has this book called The Gratitude Effect. And, and it's exactly what you said. It's that uh, journaling, uh, writing down things that have worked out well and you're grateful for, but they might not work out well, but you're still grateful for because uh, you're accepting the way things are <laughs> as opposed to thinking that they should be a particular way. So, uh, Really, um, really love the conversation with you today, Jamie, and and I'm sure you're writing a lot about this uh, through your through blogging. And um, how can the the listeners best connect with your work? So you can find me over on my website, StoicAthenium.com, which is essentially a series of long form articles where I talk a lot about philosophy. I pair it with pop culture and to try to make it accessible. You can also find me on LinkedIn as well at Jamie Ryder. And you can also find me with the Stoic Athenium handles on Twitter and Instagram as well. Fantastic. And uh, to the listeners, I'll include all those links in the show notes. So you just need to go to the show notes and you can connect with Jamie on LinkedIn or go directly to his website. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show, Jamie, for reaching out and wanting to help the listeners. I mean, you purely came from that point of love and wanting to give uh, based on your experiences and your studies and research and what's working for you. So I really appreciate you reaching out 
and really wanting to support the listeners out there and other people with their mental health journeys. So a massive appreciation to you. And I really am so grateful that you have reached out. Uh, and I'm sure the listeners are absolutely too as well. So I'm sure I'm going to get lots of great feedback on this episode. I've loved the conversation too, Anthony, honestly, because what I like to look at is if it can just help one person or if it resonates with that one person in whatever way, then that is very gratifying to me because we all need to be more open about our mental health, even in very small doses. And that, that is the essence of a good life, I think. And we don't want to be that little S stoic word, do we? We want to be the, the big <laughs> yeah, S. <laughs> big S stoics, indeed. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks so much again, Jamie. And to the listeners, I really appreciate you tuning in and uh, continuing to listen to the episodes. I would really love you to uh, share this episode if you found it of value to others because I'd really, you know, it's my mission to enhance and enlighten the well-being of others. But Jamie also resonates with that and he, he wants to help enhance and enlighten the well-being of others. So please share it with anyone that you believe that would benefit from listening to the episode and that enables us to help more people. So thanks for listening and stay tuned for more insightful episodes of Me and My Health Up.